Hello everyone, today we talk about Edward I's conquest of Wales to differentiate it uh, from the initial and but partial Norman conquest of Wales that we will discuss uh, in another video. Um, the conquest of Wales by Edward I is consequently known also as the Edwardian conquest of Wales. It took place between 1277 and 1283, right? Uh, we are essentially observing two campaigns, one in 1277 and the other in 1282-83, in which Edward I of England first greatly resized the territorial control of Luvalin ab Gruffydd, that is um, Luvalin the last, right, the Prince of Wales, as we will describe in in his prerogatives now, and then completely overran the country, as well as other, uh, together with the other uh, Welsh principalities that had partially, let's say, uh, first supported the English, uh, let's say, uh, overlordship then, because they, they were pressured by Llewellyn of Gwynedd, that already tells you uh, enough about the situation, meaning that this uh, land of, of the Celtic fringe had remained somehow unstable throughout uh, the centuries, um, and it, it was already in, in deeply intertwined to the fate of the English monarchy that wouldn't annexate Wales properly from an institutional point of view, as we will see until the 16th century, the laws uh, in Wales Acts 1535-42, but that from Edward's times, however, was de facto occupied uh, for good, stably, right? And it, it had naturally remained a, a frontier era already in Anglo-Saxon times. Of course, these were um, powers that, as we've seen uh, together with the Celtic fr French, the, the North had tried to destabilize the English power to a degree uh, during the various uh, civil wars of the 12th or 13th century. The Welsh had interfered by mostly backing the Midlands uh, rebels that had always constituted um, a bit the, the opposition to the, to the say, concentrating um, power of, of the Saxon South uh, that was also, uh, had been at least also connected with France at this point, still was, but with the significant loss of almost um, any previous Plantagenet, uh, that continental possession, at the time of Edward's grandfather, uh, John. Um, so I uh, make this video uh, in such fashion, so disclaimer. Uh, this is not about, this is not properly a Mills historical analysis of the conquest of Wales. This is a, from, from the chapter, let's say, of the original, the historical region series. So it's a really a, a short introduction to the not just the conquest, but also the settlement of Wales and in Wales by the English uh, at this specific point in history. So we will see the before. Um, Edward I's reign is so important that it's very difficult to make just a, a single video just about him. We will deal with this ruler bit by bit because he really deserves such attention as well as Welsh warfare that I already discussed uh, in a couple of videos that are uh, respectively about 13th and 14th century Welsh infantry if I remember it correctly which will help especially when we will talk about the battles of the Welsh say uh, English wars uh, naturally not just from the conquest of um, of the late 13th century. So it all comes together with lots of other stuff I made about the Celtic fringe historically, um, say there is the, the medieval British um, history playlist, so it all get that mixed and we will pass to, say, for Edward, the wars of Scottish independence, the, the crusade, um, say, just the, the English government uh, as such. Uh, and all will hopefully fall kindly together. Um, so this um, th this chapter is, is fascinating indeed. Of course, I don't have to add that I made several videos by this point about medieval England, uh, medieval English warfare, and we started from especially um, the the Norman conquest 
going step by step mostly together with the single uh, rulers until in fact Henry the, the third um, and here we are with Edward the first that we will not introduce as such for, for this reason um, during this video but we will look uh, biographically at in another one specifically so by the 13th century Wales was divided between the native Welsh principalities and the holdings of the Anglo-Norman marcher lords. Um, so th this was a frontier broadly meant. When the Normans had invaded Britain, as we'll see now, they had fundamentally already occupied and actually conquered this land uh, under the son of William the Conqueror. But for the aforementioned reason, this 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 was a frontier land that remained a bit uh, eccentric compared to the say the the Norman the the Plantagenet interests that mostly gravitated around France, right, rather than, than even England. Uh, with uh, John Henry the Third and Edward the First, you you start having a, a a very strong consolidation within the British boundaries as well, but naturally. Uh, the English monarchy was the most powerful entity and, and began to, to secure these lands that had remained eventually uh, that, uh, that autonomous and um, intended as a frontier because literally these lords had settled, um, uh, recognizing, of course, the English king's uh, sovereignty, they were uh, his subject, but leaving a bit on their own. We have seen this also in that video about the earldom of Ulster, how, how relatively easy it was, you know, if you were a quite combative uh, individual, you wanted to carve uh, a, um, in fact, a lordship on your own in the middle of, you know, a place where the English market didn't have much of a direct control, and so leaving um, Say, uh, in fact, as a lord, still brutally subjugating, killing, molding these spaces at your own image. But you, you, you could do that. And, and the martyr lords had been this. Uh, as we've seen, they had been usually treacherous um, as a general direction um, towards uh, central power because they had also married into the local, um, the local aristocracy that, as we see, had not been... Uh, and would have not it would have not been possible to completely oust right um, and so acquiring some sort of even local um, sense of themselves of course uh, th there is a sort of spectrum uh, that uh, still made the martial lords feeling English feeling uh, Norman or friend though there were different um, figures here as you know think about the importance of Savoyards uh, during uh, this this generations of English uh, monarchs. Uh, this would be important because some of the, as you know, the the most important military engineer of the mo the most beautiful castles that Edward the first erected uh, in um, in Wales after the conquest was uh, Savoyard, etc. So um, it was that continental. Uh, Civilization that had fundamentally uh, boosted further the Anglo-Saxon one and and ex expanded it uh, at the expense of these peoples that had always been depending in a way or another on the on the Germanic um, on the Anglo-Saxons that really had a, an imperial mentality ever since they set foot, even when they were fragmented in little say um, uh, say petty kingdoms, but they they had extremely clear in mind the fact that they were superior to the Celts and the, and that their ultimate goal was to subjugate them, right? Um, it was crystalline clear uh, to them. Um, in any case, um, and because it was possible, right? It was it, it was not easy, but uh, it wouldn't be easy historically, as the same Edward the First found out. Uh, with Scotland especially, the history of Wales instead is uh, smoother in this regard because it had just historically been m closer, of course, to England um, and it was a smaller country, so this would um, make it was the closest one, of course, um, just from the English center of power of, of all the Celtic fringe to, to to conquer and to, to subjugate. The leading principality was referring before was Gwynedd, 
I will, by the way, uh, butcher the, uh, the Welsh uh, pronunciation. Welsh is actually my favorite um, surviving Celtic language. I love how it sounds. It has beautiful folklore and music. Um, and uh, that, that that's really something. I hope we'll talk about Welsh history uh, again. So um, the, the Lingen Principality was Gwynedd, that, as you know, is in, in the north of, of Wales, uh, essentially on the on the Irish Sea, on, on the northwest, uh, right on the coast. Um, it was the most productive power concentrated area. They want, of course, also more sheltered from, from England that could maintain more contacts with the Bernard Norse culture, for example. Uh, at some point, the the King of Norway, through the Lordship of, uh, of the Isles, etc., had tried to harass uh, the same England, etc. These are the, the result of before to this, under the reign of Henry III and way back that is, is really complicated as far as specifically Welsh politi- internal politics, uh, which is of course all one with the, f- the foreign one, is is, um, is concerned. We can't talk about this uh, today, but uh, we will hopefully in other videos. Um, so um, the princes of Gwynedd had essentially gained control of the greater part of Wales, right, and from the north, right, the uh, Norman, Mar- the Anglo-Norman martyr lords were essentially at this point uh, relegated to, to the south. It also was developed um, uh, to to some extent compared to the north, but that um, say obviously mirrored the sort of uh, Welsh coming back, um, and uh, in with through through the same recognition of the uh, various. Um, Welsh uh, lords um, as vassals of, of, of the Welsh princes, right? The title of Prince of Wales that today is, of course, boasted by uh, by the, the male heir apparent to the English and, um, say, at the time English and, and then today British throne, um, was mm, boasted originally by the ruler of Gwynedd. Right, and uh, it was the the most important fact title um, in in the, in in Wales. Although English monarchs had made several attempts to say stabilize uh, the the land uh, in 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 their favor, like by essentially seizing control of the native Welsh territories, it was not until these wars of conquest by Edward the First. Uh, against Llewellyn, um, in specifically as Prince of Wales, um, the last one, because that's technically what, what it means, as we were saying before, Llewellyn the last, that uh, Ap Gruffudd, I mean, that this was achieved on a lasting basis. Right. Uh, most of the conquered territory of, of Wales would then be uh, retained as a royal fief, Right. In part, probably, if I understand correctly, uh, royal domain, and then um, some, as we will see, some same native Welsh that had a proximity with, with English customs by, by, say, socially. Right, they were just the the nobility there, were enfeved, reenfeved. Right, um, recognizing at this point the English king as their overlord. Right. With still the maintenance of the the title of in fact Prince of Wales that um, would be in fact endowed to the train uh, to to the heir to the English throne, um, and the remainder of the country uh, would be granted to Edward's supporters as new martyr lordships that fell uh, under uh, of course the same uh, authority of the king. Uh, up in the hierarchy, um, and although such territories would be uh, de facto uh, controlled by the English, like mark but through these campaigns and marking the end of uh, Welsh independence, as we were saying before, it would not uh, Wales would not be incorporated into the Kingdom of England until the 16th century, following a series of invasions beginning shortly after their conquest of England in 1066, the Normans had seized m- much 
of, of the country, right? Had already established this, uh, again, quasi-independent martyr uh, lordship, owing allegiance uh, to the English crown. Um, over time, as we already noticed, however, the Welsh, native Welsh princ principalities, such as Gwynedd, Powys, and uh, Dehae Barth, uh, survived. And from the end of the 11th century, they, this began to push back the Norman advance. We have already seen what Welsh warfare was about. Very, was very traditional, uh, Celtic uh, wise, right? They, the Welsh relied on this sort of uh, hit and run strategy and tactics, um, and they um, were mostly, uh, say, foot armies meant that of course most of them like also the english ones were uh, everybody in sedentary europe was but with a greater bias towards these that were often very uh they were pretty um pretty competent in guerrilla and in this sort of harassment of the enemy through a quite also, you know morphologically complex uh, territory like the welsh one they would have more problems to face especially the Anglo-Norman heavy cavalry in open field, um, they had apparently good archers, uh, albeit it is a myth that the Welsh uh, archers were anything better or worse than the English one, just a myth that was born uh, in contemporary historiography because of a very poor interpretation of the sources. Um, uh, and they had, of course, their own elite, their own mounted forces that, however, could often not compete um, uh, in, especially in quality, with the uh, English ones, right? Of course, uh, a Welsh nobleman would would be able to afford, say, the, the most updated, let's say, uh, arms and armor, right, from French in English um, military uh, culture, material culture. Um, however, the possibility of fielding large amounts of these w was much less than than their uh, English rivals, right? Uh, so uh, it's it, it, the same story. This is this is a power that manages to, to coalesce through some important resources locally, etc. But at at the fringe of a, of a greater power that, when stabilizing, basically is able to to crush right this this country. In fact, as we will see, Edward the First's um, intervention in in Wales originally was not even aimed at uh, a war of conquest, right, because, you know, there were, he had other problems, uh, admittedly, and uh, say it's just how the situation developed there and escalated further later that, you know, made him uh, take this good decision to, uh, to quell the Welsh uh, once for all. Um, so, after the Anglo-Norman conquest, the Welsh... Uh, made again this powerful effort to say recover as much powerful uh, power as possible locally but say being able to do so only in on the occasion of internal issues of the english market that were really frequent i mean the normans established uh, in england one of the most solid monarchies by the the, the, the late uh, 11 the early 12th century then things started being compromised dramatically, that centralizing potential, this market could be literally, actually, England could become one. Of the, the state in Europe with the strongest monarchic absolutism of all, right? But uh, starting from the you know the disaster of the White Ship, the you know all the the dynastic mess, the the baronial rebellions, etc., followed later. Like the, the country had suffered, and at this point, the Welsh would as we said, usually allied themselves with the Midland rebels that, you know, didn't really like the Welsh more than, say, the the Saxons, the, let's say, say London, and the, the, the Anglo-Norman, the, the, the Plantagenet monarchy. Uh, but, of course, could receive support by these, uh, these forces that could also profit to take over some martyr lord that say, one by one, just to, to provide that support. Um, it was an incredibly complex and gradual thing, right? You can't even 
say that they rationally pursued, say, of course, they pursued that policy, that strategy, but they, it, it would have, it was just natural given the conditions as they presented themselves. So you don't really have something like, I don't know, a powerful Welsh state that is founded at this point or is striving, whatever. It's, they are just essentially principalities, lordships that have a an ethnic cohesion they had of course they have suffered this conquest right they see um in general the english as uh, say some some uh, foreigners that had imposed their yoke on them so they they didn't uh, of course they, they were trying to improve their condition there is some there are some episodes that really uh, also exemplify the statements the the, the position of this of, of Wales that was trying to enter even the, the that realm of legions, for example, of Trojan uh, matrix about who had started to rule in you know who's the the original ancestor of the Welsh who, who was he more or less noble than than the English than the Anglo Normans etc. There was a lot also the Scots that that um, but again the the situation was quite. Um, delicate. Uh, at some point, some important um, Welsh rulers, also in in the family of uh, Llywelyn, uh, Ab Gruffudd, had been imprisoned in the Tower of London, even killing, getting themselves killed in the process of escape. There had the the English monarchs had always played uh, against the the rebellious Welsh by using, especially the again, I don't know the the broader of the Prince of Wales from Gwynedd to go there and claim his own share, taking out his sibling and f- backed by English, etc. And this all mixed with dynastic issues because once you, you, you know, one, say, if your candidate died, for example, you had, um, say, more free reigns of, 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 the, of the guys from the other side and you have such escalations connected with that as well, so an incredibly messed up um, situation. Um, Herod II sought to conquer several times the native Welsh principalities. Nevertheless, by the end of, of the 12th uh, century, the martyr lordships were reduced to the south and southeast of Wales. Um, this area, in fact, known as the, the Martyr Lordships, uh, that uh, it was like like one third of the country at at, at most. Uh, the Principality of Gwynedd was the dominant power at this time uh, in the first half of the 13th century, already with some substantial recognition by the rest of the country. Because don't give that for granted. Like um, it's a bit like Scotland or Ireland. Like you have all these different competitors as we just said it was difficult for them to just centralize even without uh, this uh, foreign interference then you have uh, Powys and De Heibart um, essentially becoming um, tribal states right Powys would be uh, essentially the the native Welsh northern part uh, subjected to Gwynedd um, and um, Dohe Bart roughly the the southern one, uh, both actually developing latitudinally and bordering with the marcher lordships in the south, um, but um, the Hay Bart uh, separated from from Gwynedd, not being uh, contiguous to that, but bordering uh, with both the Kingdom of England, the marcher lordships, just like Povis. Um, there were other lordships, for example. Yeah, I mean, there was a sort of spectrum like the uh, Yarlake Sayer, I, I, I presume it's pronounced, that fundamentally depended still on the English crowd. It was, was somehow more assimilated. Um, usually they dealt with Gwynedd in, in Chester, even as, for for example, for the English monarch to receive so the Welsh uh, homage of things like that. The concept of the Welsh principality stemming exactly from the been a um, rule over Povis and Deibart, right, and the tribe is paid from the latter to the former. 
The Principality had fought with England in 1241 and 1245 because of a dynastic dispute in the succession to the throne. Uh, this had weakened Gwynedd and allowed Henry III to seize the perfect Vlad, that is, uh, or Iber, um, Iber perfect Vlad, uh, that is essentially the, the middle land, um, also known as the, the Fort Cantrefs, that were uh, essentially a historical destructuration of, of, of Wales um, to the local lordly powers um, and uh, so the, this area that actually it, it affected mostly the eastern part uh, of, of the country right from 1256 there was however a coming back of Greenhead under Llewellyn up Gruffudd uh, that resumed the war with Henry III and took back in fact the perfect Vlad in 1267, you have the Treaty of Montgomery, right? Uh, by which uh, Llewellyn was acknowledged as Prince of Wales by King Henry III of England in return for doing the homage to the to the English monarch, showing surely a you know a, a temporary lack. of of interest in committing English forces massively in Wales, but still the dependence of the latter on uh, on the monarch uh, as just the, the, the proportion of forces was uh, suggesting by itself. Llewellyn was thus also recognized as Prince of Wales, um, and the reconquest of the Middle Land was accepted by Henry uh, in the treaty. Yet, there were some disturbances still, because, um, of course, like in the best tradition of feudal Europe, we can call it, there was a significant fragmentation, and Llewellyn at some point did go at war with some of the martyr lords in the south, for example, Gilbert de Clare, Roger Mortimer, Humphrey de Bohun, uh, etc. This was somehow typical. Uh, it's not exemplificative of, say, a major struggle, but it still, of course, had uh, ramifications with uh, English policy. Henry III died in 1272, and his son, Edward I, uh, succeeded him. Um, great figure, uh, as you know, and, and as I say, normally, you know, well depicted as a successful ruler, and opposed, perhaps a bit too stereotypically, against an allegedly weak father, uh, in a, say, from a political point of view. Uh, of course, um, under Henry, you have uh, uh, a destabilization of um, the English monarchy, at least during the the civil wars with Montfort, etc., but this were also typical, somewhat of, at least, uh, Engl the English kingdom um, uh, f from from generations. Uh, Edward had contributed to put an end to that, um, and as we will see, the uh, the the Welsh involvement uh, in the civil war against Henry III, specifically the support of uh, Llewellyn uh, to to Simon to the the rebel Simon de Montfort had uh, of course placed a bit of um, you know a strain there the Welsh had not participated at the climatic battle of Evesham but um, they still had profited of those connections and were still connected with the house of Montfort where it remained somehow rebellious untrustworthy uh, reputation, right? Edward was uh, a strong and also impositive ruler, um, a skilled commander, was one of the key figures uh, in the in English Middle Ages, and especially because of the expansion uh, over the Celtic fringe. In 1274, the conflict between Llewellyn and Edward uh, intensified, when uh, Griffith up Gwenvindin, um, that was a Welsh king, lord 
uh, of the part of Powis known known as in fact Powis Win uh, Win Win and Louvelin's younger brother David Ab Griffith defected to Edward seeking the English monarch's protection. Right. Uh, because Louvain was objectively a powerful ruler, and uh, these um, uh, these lords, including sibling, uh, it was the it wasn't the only one, were essentially opposing themselves to the to such concentration of of of, uh, of authority. Uh, there was an ongoing conflict with the martial lords still by the way, particularly over Roger Mortimer's new castle at Sethlis uh, in uh, Radnorshire. Thus, Edward's protection of the defectors led the Prince of Wales to refuse the English monarch's request to present himself at Chester in 1275 to do homage to him. Right, uh, Let's realize that Griffith and David had plotted uh, to kill uh, Llewellyn himself and uh, share basically uh, his uh, his power. David would have become prince and Griffith would have been uh, rewarded with some land. Um, so coming to Chester, given that these guys were now under the, the protection of, of Edward, seemed like... Uh, but uh, unsafe, right? So there was also a sense of pride. Obviously, these were traitors, um, and uh, Llewellyn was the legitimate ruler of Gwynedd, at least uh, as the most powerfully recognized Welsh um, ruler, as we've seen just by uh, he- uh, Edward's father. Uh, by the uh, that, however had imposed the homage to be, say, uh, continuing, at least through feudal law, we would expect that, uh, that when the crown of England passed from, uh, to, to, the new, to the new ruler, uh, such homage would be repeated. So it was still a world that reasoned ad personam, right? But, uh, so there was some you know, important political implications in, in showing this, this this obedience. As we were saying at the beginning, it, at this point Edward had not planned to conquer Wales altogether because, you know, the, the importance was mostly to, to quell sort of rebellious, um, almost subject vassal, right? So um, Edward um, actually uh, had his reasons to to feel provoked by Llewellyn uh, himself, given that the Prince of Wales had planned to marriage Eleanor, the daughter of Simon de Montfort, that had almost ruined uh, his house. Um, So in November 1276, the King of England declared war on Llewellyn. And again, this is still essentially a personal thing. Right, his objective was to put down this uh, recalcitrant vassal, but not to embark um, England in a war of Welsh conquest. So, the first invasion uh, starts early in 1277. The main uh, royal army had yet to be mustered. Right, so Edward deploys before this, which would take time. Uh, in south uh, and mid Wales, so with the support of mostly the, the martial lords, but also some native Welsh that was siding, of course, with, as we've seen with uh, with him, uh, a mix of forces that is representative of mostly English, uh, generally speaking, European, fe- Western feudal uh, armies at the time, um, of mercenary of soldiers um, hired in different ways uh, through Indentur, some of the martyr lords retinues and knights of the royal household right so um, a mix of trusted people that could just a bit test the country seeing 
what could be done and this smaller force met uh, with considerable success right because many native welsh rulers at this point had uh, been dissatisfied with Llewellyn's uh, rule right they feared this guy was becoming too powerful and, and they were not say fully aware also because signals from england were were objectively different that of the threat now posed by the by the english uh invasion de facto um so that they surrendered and joined to edward's uh, forces this was essentially just to topple the regime or at least to drastically resize as will happen uh Llewellyn's, um uh, uh power uh but it would also show the degree of Welsh uh, permeability, uh, and thus the, you know, would also scent a bit that sort of anguish and and hatred from Llewellyn, but also by those who would now be in turn dissatisfied with the English um, officials, especially left there uh, in the country, uh, to really realize what was going on. In July 1277, Edward launches uh, a, a punitive expedition into North Wales, so uh, essentially to the heart of Llewellyn's power. At this point, he had gathered an army of 15,500 men, of which 9,000 were Welsh, mostly from the south, so we're talking about a good half of the uh, of of the country um, that were, by the way, raised through the normal, also uh, say feudal summons, like local levies plus the mercenary forces. I made a video about 13th century English uh, armies, that organization at Similia, so you can check those out. We will have to make really a lot more about this because. It's it's fascinating. Lots of interesting stuff was happening. Um, the, uh, for example, Welsh infantry was significantly vulnerable at this point to uh, to this Anglo-Welsh archery force. There is a bit of this stereotype that the the Southerners were a bit more uh, archers than the northerners as pyramid that's a cliche what what this really means in my opinion and we'll have to study the sources carefully is that on this occasion the, the english just had some better training discipline organization and so it was at some point um easier to soften up the the enemy ranks um before eventually charging into them against uh with with cavalry which was a bit what the English now were starting to, to develop like within Britain with what they already had because English archers were good some footsman community especially of, of the Midlands uh, in the north were 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 famous right and we see that English archers in Edward the first army were paid more than the Welsh ones which surely something uh, it, it does mean right um, in any case this was a massive expedition against which Llewellyn could not do much. Um, the English royal army had left from Chester at it, as its um, base and had moved into Gwynedd itself. Uh, they camped first at Flint, then at Rutland, then at Dagenway, and most likely uh, making a mess right in, in these places like ravaging the country so showing like just, just to undermine um Llewellyn's, uh authority prestige material power uh, etc plus the english were supported by a naval force right, that was um supplied by the sunk ports in southeast england right uh, this were important logistical bases um mostly sending supplies and uh, helping the operations against the coastal fortress. So at this point, Llewellyn realizes that it's over, like there is not uh, a sense to, to continue this. Uh, he 
he also refused uh, to try his luck in, in a major battle. It was too risky, plus it would have strained essentially just the north of Wales, even in case victory it would have cost uh, Rune a lot. He um, was uh, surely uh, resisting with an important amount of forces, um, but he, for exactly for this reason, decided to uh, negotiate, or at least to accept the same Edward's mm, talks, to settle the matter peacefully, uh, diplomatically, not militarily. Right? And the reason being that the same English had been stretching their supply lines, Right, uh, Edward was a great organizer, uh, logistician. The, the English had an early sense of central um, organization, administration. They had, say, you know, already, uh, you know, certain s stores of standardized catapult projectiles, all well, well, things like that, managed by the monarchy. A very tidy, effective thing, but it cost, right? It, it, it may be that the same, the same Edward was running short of men and supplies. You, you realize that some, most of these troops numerically were, um, were levied by the Welsh. That also the sense could not be uh, squeezed too much at that point. Also, soldiers and royal troops do cost. So by November twelve uh, seventy seven. Um, there is a negotiate that brings finally to the Treaty of Aberconway, in which Llewellyn is emerging defeated, definitely. Um, he basically would control from there on, at least on the base of this treaty, the western part of Gwynedd. Though he was allowed to retain the title of Prince of Wales because Edward did not want to humiliate the guy. He was just annoyed by him, but uh, he was evidently anxious just to just keep the, the gradual process of anglicization that would have unavoidably um, that, 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 that Wales would have unavoidably underwent uh, with a strong um, English neighbor, right? And in increasing ties just also between the aristocracies, uh, etc. A practical consequence was that um, Eastern Gwynedd at the frontier with England was, was split between Edward and Llewellyn's brother Duffet that was thus r essentially reinstated in, in Wales at least through this, uh, this possessions becoming effectively Edward's tributary in the process, right? So what first was given by uh, Easter Gwynedd to actually itself, uh, plus naturally lots of other uh, Welsh lands after, after this English invasion. Now we're not being paid to the Prince of Wales, but to the English king. So this was a way naturally to su subtract a lot of resources to Llewellyn, that was, however, still, look, you know, I defeated you, I I resize your ambitions, but I respect your role, your nobility, your traditional title of Prince of Wales, as long as this thing stops, right? Um, as a result of this territorial expropriations, the submission of um, the ruling families, the Haybarth, Povis, Mid Wales became essentially a mixture of directly controlled English royal land and pliant English protectorates. Um, this was obvious because, um, in general, this display of force had helped changing uh, also the leaders locally had uh, brought to the the adjustment of certain and the settlement of certain feuds within the same Welsh uh, aristocracy had brought to some Englishmen to, obviously to profit from that 
Uh, and it was an important victory for Edward because it was, first of all, a comprehensive settlement. It had provided with this major redistribution of power and territory uh, in Wales, in England's favor. And the monarch enjoyed uh, a greater uh, amount of control in native Welsh areas that had not recognized essentially any English um, control before. We're talking about direct control. There were actually uh, English uh, and, uh, and royal, English royal officials r ruling these lands from the same castles, uh, etc. So it, it was a true occupation of some areas that had previously maybe recognized English uh, overlordship theoretically, but that had never seen an English, a direct English rule there, um, especially a royal one, because again, that wave of Anglo-Normans had already occurred at the beginning, but they had, uh, it had been absorbed somehow locally as well, and mostly, and or mostly pushed away in a more identifiable English way in the south. Um, however, this settlement was not to last, because in 1282, war broke out again. The reason was the rebellion by Llewellyn's brother Duffield, who was um, actually uh, demanding more to Edward um, from what he had expected at the Treaty of Abercombe. Duffield was the cause of this. He launched a series of attacks coordinated with Welsh uh, uh, rulers in Dewebarth and North Powys, who had been Llewellyn's vassals until 1277, and now had uh, switched to Edward, um, still as essentially English vassals. So Llewellyn and other Welsh leaders at this point um, joined the um, the rebellion because they thought this, that the, their forces could be enough to tip the balance and really make a change uh, with, with the objective of essentially throwing the English out uh, of Wales. And, and this sentiment was shared by a significant amount of Welsh. In fact, um, also in the south, um, and especially in, in some of these areas that had been directly controlled now by the English royal of, uh, officials from from some year, there was a greater discontent. Um, so the campaign of 1282-83 is um, triggered by a, a much larger rebellion that truly has the objective of expelling uh, the English and from the English side uh, of conquering, like putting down um, the Welsh for good. Right. Uh, there is a sort of national sentiment, of course, because a united Welsh fort against the, the foreigner, the historical enmity between the, the Anglo-Saxons, the, the Romano-Britons, etc., was still living in, in, those, uh, in those peoples, in their legions, in their folklore, in their language. But these people spoke another language. Um, and, but in, in a typically medieval fashion, what had triggered the most the Welsh had been Edward's attempts to impose English law on them. Right? This naturally meant also a control from English uh, jurists, English lawyers. So it was a way to just make things work uh, in order to not just making the English profit of the wall, but literally molding Wales into a, essentially an appendix of England. It's at this point that Edward realized that he had to take over the entire Welsh nation. And in grand style, he organizes, in fact, a three-pronged attack of Wales uh, along its uh, latitude, right, attacking essentially the north, the center, and the south at the same time. So, essentially, with, with the purpose of, of, 
obliging the enemy to, to divide their forces um, to at least uh, avoid a large swaths of their country to be ravaged uh, in the process with consequences that would have, of course, had long-lasting uh, effects even after a, a possible Welsh uh, victory. Uh, the king uh, led his army uh, through into North Wales, like in the first uh, expedition from Chester, because the North was essentially the, uh, the hotbed of the rebellion, the heart of the strongest Welsh power of of Gwynedd. Roger Mortimer, the first Baron of Wigmore, operated instead in mid Wales, while uh, Gilbert de Clare, the sixth Earl of Hertford and the seventh of Gloucester, uh, advanced with a robust army in the south, right, where he had to gain a land right rising to north. Naturally, the, all these forces were coordinated, and it, this is a testament, again, to Edward's military uh, mind and, and capacity. However, the Welsh were initially successful. Right? In June 1282, Gloucester was defeated at the Battle of Landelo Fair. This was a significant uh, defeat we we're not sure about the um, the losses, but precisely, but they were heavy, right? That was the almost complete destruction of Gloucester's army uh, achieved by the, the Southern Welsh. Uh, we know uh, Gilbert de Clare had around 100 cavalry and 1,600 infantry. So this was... Uh, an important blow, and, and it showed also how uh, the uh, less, let's say, performing Southern Welsh were, say, that once they had somehow more been more absorbed by the English, etc., were still capable of of defending their uh, their cause from the recent offences of of the royal officials, uh, etc. Edward replaced Gloucester with William of Lusignan um, de Valence, Earl of Pembroke, who raided in the south as far as Aberystwyth, um, that was uh, a very important uh, center also for the supplies of the Welsh army that still, however, refused to engage. Right. Edward uh, then suffered himself a setback in mid-Wales when his commander there, Roger Mortimer, died in October. On November the 6th, while John Peckham, Archbishop of Canterbury, was conducting peace negotiations, there was uh, an initiative by Luke de Tenney uh, and, and an English noble, uh, once the Seneschal of Gascony and Constable of Thickill Castle in Narrowsborough won, um, who, who commanded the king's forces in Anglesey, that is um, the, at least the county today, but named after the, the island, right, the anonymous island, that also was crucial for Welsh supplies. Uh, and carrying out a surprise attack on the Welsh, really by his own initiative. This was a mistake, uh, because Tanny and his troops crossed over a pontoon bridge that they had built uh, on Anglesey Island to the mainland. At that point, being ambushed by the Welsh, Right. Um, there had been a, a rising tide that had prevented essentially the, the English to to uh, to cross uh, effectively. They were disrupted, and the Welsh at that point uh, fell on them from higher ground and uh, essentially massacred 
the English, who trying to escape drowned. This battle is known as Mal y Don, uh, because of the, the name of this locality that, however, doesn't seem to have been the actual one. We are, however, uh, at the Menai Strait, right? This narrow stretch of shallow tidal water, uh, which separates the uh, the island of Anglesey from mainland um, Wales. Uh, we're talking here even of a greater losses than the one in 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 the south before, um, because the English uh, under Thanny who died himself, uh, by the way, during the battle, um, were two hundred uh, cavalrymen and two uh, two thousand infantry. And we know that at least more than 400 of them died, probably among also the finest troops, the Welsh, lost uh, a few troops, apparently. Uh, in spite of these setbacks, the English force was preponderant, right? And uh, the, the odds began to tilt in favor of Edward. The greatest blow to the Welsh occurred at the Battle of Orwen Bridge with the death of Llewellyn himself. Right, This was not just uh, a material blow because in this battle uh, there were several thousand Welsh um, and around 2,000 of them died but because of the loss of Llewellyn um, the struggle against the English uh, was dramatically uh, deprived of, of, of morale. Right? This battle was fought on December the 11th, 1282. Uh, it has an interesting, uh, say, tactical development we can talk about in, in a dedicated video. Uh, essentially, the English, uh, uh, essentially and apparently, because that's what we get from the sources, had convinced uh, Llewellyn uh, to move away from his army to negotiate um, in in another in another locality, so that he wouldn't be. In, I mean, he would be a few kilometers distant, but um, uh, not enough to, to command the army directly. And this was essentially uh, destroyed by uh, by the English through combined arm uh, tactics. Right, they they showered the Welsh uh, spear men with uh, with their archers. The Welsh forces were mostly mostly infantry, right? We know that there were 160 Teulu, that is from um, the, prin uh, the, the Prince of Wales uh, household, but there were, you know, uh, the, the, the English had 1,300 heavy cavalry apparently and 5,000 infantry, so there was a hell of a disproportion. They, the Welsh were in, in a, an advantageous position but after having been showered by this and being so adequately softened up by by the english arrows they were charged and uh, not just frontally but in the rear of the army which was somehow typical uh, the leader was not there and when and, and so the welsh army broke llewellyn was killed while coming back to the battlefield by so randomly, together with other forces of his household, he was mortally wounded. There were legions about also the fate of his of his corpse because he, uh, you know, he, he while he was dying, he was communicated by a priest, and that's where he revealed who he was uh, to the English that were there as well. Uh, he was beheaded, and his head was there are legions again. In fact, it was exposed also in London, etc. Similar to you know, think about Wallace, etc. But uh, later on, and uh, others say that nobody knows where, where he's buried. Some believe in the Abbey Grimmer. Um It's just a tradition. Uh, in any case, what, what is important for today's video is you know, the, this, this defeat that really dispirited dramatically um, the Welsh and just prefigured the, the outcome uh, of the war. Right. Um, in fact, uh, this was like a random success, meaning that the Welsh were, were not, say, just easily, uh, couldn't quite just put them down um, in terms of resistance, because they realized they were really fighting their, their last useful uh, battle here. Uh, I mean, 
battle in, in, a, in a broader sense, not necessarily the, the, the one of Arwen, right? But the debt of Louvelin that had somehow a Germanized Welsh policy had represented a, throughout the, the decades a uh, point of reference in spite of all this trouble within the same Welsh, um, within the same household of, of the prince and the Welsh aristocracy it was really a symbolic uh, loss uh, grab it with you know with meaning and this by the way gave Edward time to rise a new army and to march uh, boldly like with his uh, strategic understanding in Snowdonia or Eriri that is this mountainous region in, in northwestern Wales, where in January 1283, by the way, so consider the um, just even the, the challenges logistically uh, of the weather, etc. And he captured Dollywood Land Castle, right in um, Conway County Borough. Um, the um, the the move was important because, of course, the Saint Welsh after the say the season had largely this was typical of them it would materialize in one place and then scatter home um, just with this hit and run strategy not just tactics um, and making this corpse in winter was actually uh, a matter of really of great expertise in um, medieval warfare this dull with the line so you understand the point right that, that the Welsh could react in part there was a, a garrison at Dolwit the land but um, the um, it was just it right and in order to mobilize a coordinated resistance uh, you know uh, after this lightning uh, operation uh, there was uh, it was very difficult this was the heartland of the Welsh resistance by the way uh, at the same time uh, the Lusignan the Valance in the south uh, advanced from Cardigan into uh, Mayoronit, the this coastal mountainous religion Wales, uh, in uh, in the north, right, just in in the south of Gwynedd, and the combined pressure uh, from the the south and the king's advance into the north was definitely a pincer movement that the core land of Welsh resistance could not uh, withstand. That's the reason why the conquest of Gwynedd was completed by June 1283. Uh, that uh, so the capture of Dafid, who had uh, in, in the meanwhile succeeded Llewellyn, his brother, as Prince of Wales uh, the previous uh, December. This guy was, as we've seen, he had first sided with the English, then he had rebelled against them, so he was uh, executed as a traitor in the following autumn in Shrewsbury. So that was definitely dealt with, with much less troubles than Llewellyn, that you know, was a great lord, respected by the English uh, to some degree at least. Uh, in any case, he was rebellious to uh, that point. There, was, there were many other ways this whole thing could end, uh, frankly. So the aftermath of Edward's conquest of Wales was the gradual uh, absorption of the land in, into the English kingdom, de facto, and the Euro later on. Edward took care first, of course, of this, um, of the organization of Wales, dividing the country into principalities between himself, that of course retained um, this uh, territories under direct royal control as part of really the, the royal domain, and his supporters through feudal grants, right, which in practice became new martyr lordships, let's say in the same mode they had been established um, since, since the, the beginning of of English rule. Uh, there were very important Anglo-Norman uh, noblemen, such as the Earl of Lincoln, uh, who, uh, Henry de la Cive, who received the lordship of Denbag uh, in, in the process. This, this, these were 
matter of, say, of honor, of politeness, of, say, of recognition, of status, privilege, power, uh, etc. But the native Welsh themselves received in part back their own lands, which was, of course, a, a wise maneuver because you don't quite enter a country, yes, crush it, uh, you know, it's pitch for, let's say, it's campaign forces, but you, um, you, know, you, you hope just to rule the, the land. It remains inhabited by people that have fought prior against you. So the only difference here is that you, th this Welsh were essentially keeping their land on a, we're talking about arist arist aristocracy, uh, on a feudal basis. So in practice now they were recognizing the possession of that specific land to the, the English monarchy through the Prince of Wales and the English monarch uh, hierarchically. For example, we have Alwain ap Gruffydd, that was the heir representative to the Welsh Principality of Powys when uh, Vin Vin until 1283, right, when it was abolished by the Parliament of Shrewsbury. Um, it would became essentially the first Lord of Powys, practically receiving back his ancestral lands that would be known, in fact, belonging to the, the to the anglicized version of Owen de la Pole or Poole sometimes spelled um, this is fascinating uh, however it was an important degree of English imposition uh, lands retained under direct royal control were organized under the statute of Radland of 1284 essentially Confirming, uh, conferring the constitutional basis for the government of the Principality of Wales until uh, the 16th century. The statute declared that these lands were annexed and united to the English crown. Right? I remember that the crown and the kingdom are two different things. Right? The crown is something much more, say, personal and, uh, say, intended as, as a dignity and a power intrinsic to the ruler. The kingdom has somehow a greater institutional relevance. It's, it's also more connected with the actual territorial borders of the institution, etc. And at this point, again, Wales was not England, right? Uh, as it would become in the 16th century. I know some, some Welsh old, you know, listener will have some some teardrop crossing his trick but I understand that but that that's how it went this is also the point in history when the heir to the English throne was conferred the title of Prince of Wales um, this um, stemmed from the fact from the, the, the prior this new organization that, um, Wales was essentially a king's personal thief and in virtue of that um, Edward decided in 1301 to bestow Wales uh, on his son, the, the, fu uh, the future Edward II, that at the, at the time, um, because of his prin uh, Welsh principality, uh, was known as Edward of Cernarborn, right, uh, in Wales. Um, so the, from there on, the custom of endowing uh, the Welsh principality to the heir uh, of to the heir of the, to the English throne remained uh, to this day. Now the statue of Radland divided Wales under royal control, specifically into six shire counties, um, uh, essentially in the same model of the English kingdom. As a consequence administered by royal officials. So this gives you the dimension of, of the war of occupation and, con and the conquest that had followed. The statute also enforced the adoption of English common law in Wales, which, as we've seen, had been uh, possibly the, the hottest point of content, or at least, you know, the one that would, in fact, just make the Welsh go under if they had not uh, tried at least to rebel. Um, there was some adaptation, surely, to Welsh um, 
low as well because in the Middle Ages nothing is so drastically categorical. But uh, take for example, Welsh, uh, Welsh law continued to be used in some civil causes, for example, in matters of land inheritance, because you know that's how the, even the martyr lords, to some degree, had habituated themselves uh, to go by, and it, it was in part negotiated, which in this sense, in fact, did see some. Uh, modification because the inheritance law pretty much everywhere is also the most important in terms of again like connected with property uh, acquisition in times and places as you understand here that you know had otherwise difficult ways just just to have a directly uh, impositive um, justice being um, fulfilled right so uh, illegitimate sons, for example, could not longer claim part of the inheritance, which Welsh law had allowed them to do, but this stemmed from some sort of more tribal, clanic mentality that, of course, had no place in the type of Wales that, that the country was to become under, under the English, that were much more, like, uh, you know, linearly... Um, say concentrating their own uh, their own wealth, the firstborn son, uh, etc. We're talking about also large inheritances specifically, so a way to prevent this chronic uh, fragmentation. That also because it, it just reflected the, the incapacity right, to to concentrate power by these people from a political institutional point of view. So it's obviously something coming just with with a more compact model. Um, the mark of Wales was maintained under the Martian lords um, because, I mean, it didn't make so much sense to just change that, particularly uh, these were in part the same people who had contributed to the expeditions, they just wanted to keep things as they were, it was essentially feudalism, again, this was not even England, so who cares, like to invest uh, sources to change this and discontenting them doesn't really uh, matter. Um, undoubtedly, however, the, the entire country, uh, especially from the 90s of, of the 13th century, began to be managed um, directly by, more directly by the king, right, that intervened in the affairs also of the mark to a much greater extent than had been the case before. And, and all this was possible thanks to the, as you know, massive, to say the least, um, uh, amount of fortification of the country, right? Uh, that, of course, reflected also broader colonization, also from England, uh, but that is best represented by some of the most beautiful uh, military architecture of the Middle Ages, the Welsh castles of Edward I, in particular the castles and town walls of King Edward in Gwynedd, that uh, is a UNESCO designated World Heritage Site, and it, it tells you, of course, how uh, the most um, rebellious part, uh, the most dangerous part of the, of the country, had been brought how, uh, d down with this severely, you know, uh, strong bulwarks uh, that were properly aiming at, you know, deterring any kind of thought of, of rebellion, and that also embodied, like, the, of course, the, the importance of Wales, just per se, the, the local demographic and agricultural resources that could have, if not properly uh, controlled from the above, uh, possibly bro uh, brought to another uprising, and we have seen how dangerous during the war Welsh forces had been. Uh, so this um, this architecture went again in parallel with all a, all a system that um, uh, was promoted by Edward himself uh, by sending English colonists. Uh, to settle in, in Wales. There were new towns created at this point. Flint, uh, Aberystwyth, 
that we mentioned before, but it was re refound at um, occasion. Rodlin, right? Then, uh, then by Shire, um, etc. Outside the towns, the Welsh peasants were evicted from key areas as well that were resettled by English peasants, right? These centers just alone had, with a castle, had their own strategic importance, but the, the countryside naturally was the one also in which the, the towns depended, and so you couldn't quite maintain there some population that had manifested a particular you know, hatred towards the English. Uh, so you have the aforementioned lordship of Denby uh, occupied by English settlers uh, for 10,000 acres by 1334. Right, so it was a long-term process, but such uh, territory is, is pretty extensive, and it gives you a dimension of, sort of the, the mobilization, the deportation, the re resettlement of lots of L Welsh people uh, in the process and the injection of this English element in the in the country that of course had already existed but not in some of these areas to that degree ever had diluted in the, the, the Celtic Sostratum. Edward's main concern after his victory was to stabilize this through in fact the the, the chain of castles that we have observed, and he uh, made use of James of St. George, uh, this master of works uh, architect from Savoy, right, was one of, definitely one of the greatest architects of me in medieval Europe, um, and who, who was the, who didn't build just that, right, there are places in, in France that he also uh, fortified, or famous uh, etc. So it was a person of international fame, and if you look at, we don't have time now to talk about it, we may do it soon, but the, the, the essence of this structure's uh, uh, function is it, one of the most uh, updated at the time. Certain are foreign castle, right, embodying a bit the, the Welsh principality is perhaps the, the, the most beautiful, the best, the greatest uh, of, of them all. They had all of this distinctive design that is so pretty grim, uh, you know, it makes you understand pretty clearly who was in charge there, and that was indeed the uh, the purpose, right? The idea was to form a sort of ring of stone around North Wales, so to sever it also from the rest of the country, um, and so just as we've seen, the, the rebellions had started from there, and the rest of the country had followed. So if you control the north. Um, uh, you had uh, much greater chances of not seeing anybody else rebelling without that. But there was literally nobody else could intervene also overseas there, in spite of you know some sympathy, some support that the Welsh had gained from 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 the Norse, from other Celts before. Major structures um, are the castles of Beaumaris, Cerner, for in fact, Conway and Arlick. And these are uh, all, in fact, in in the north of of the country. The first uh, in uh, in Anglesey. So uh, we see the same places we the last in Gwynedd, the Conway one uh, still in this strategic location, etc. So they all had a uh, very spot on, of course, uh, location provided with the strategic meaning that occupying them and controlling the country through was was seen from from the top. Um, you w you want to appreciate in this sense also Edwards polyedric mind he was definitely a sort of um, ethereal guy right he was smart and uh, he he had a sense of how things really could be worked out here uh, naturally after the conquest of Wales there would be further Welsh rebellions right because it just doesn't 
take to do all this. There are other problems going on um, in England and or in the same country. So we have revolts, for example, in 1287-88. Uh, the more serious one of 1294 under Madoc Llewellyn that um, proclaimed himself Prince of Wales once again uh, and that was also a lasting revolt of some sort uh, the the second uh, after the one of Owen Glyndwyr in, in the 15th century um, there was the one of th- this was a relative of uh, Llewellyn, right? Yeah. Uh, and of course, the, the dynasts here, the, the feudal lord, were all somehow uh, married into each other so they could claim uh, rights of inheritance, etc. In 1316, 1318, you have uh, also the, during the wars of Scottish independence, the one of Llewellyn. Bren, right? Um, it this was truly the the revolt that marked the last serious challenge to English rule in Wales, right? At least until the fifteenth century, this guy was the Lord of Sanctinet, right? In in the south of Wales, uh, in the Upper Valley, uh, in the seventies of the fourteenth century, you have Owain Lovegok that was at least the last representative in the main line of the ruling house of Gwynedd to um, at least plan two invasions of Wales with French support. And in the 15th century, in 1400 precisely, uh, a Welsh nobleman, Owen Glendover, or Owen Glendover, led this most famous uh, revolt that we will see uh, at some point, but this also ended uh, predictably, and the general, say, outlook here is, of course, of a country that was, for obvious reasons, was the smallest of, of the of the other. It was not even a kingdom technically, right? So we talk of the three kingdoms later, and so we can appreciate also Scottish and Irish resistance to a degree that really uh Wales had missed um historically but um it's still worth noticing the the effort made to bring this country down it was one of it was a successful enterprise right they could have not done such a thing so simply with Scotland they failed with with Ireland at least you know just some parts of the island of course the most important but still not the entirety of, of the country was was kept under um, say in a bit of an immobilistic way, there was also a hierarchy of importance of issues again for the English monarchy. But you you want to appreciate the fact that Edward I spent around one hundred seventy three thousand pounds to um, uh, to 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 conquer Wales. Right, uh, this is the financial cost uh, of the entire war plus the construction of the new castles. Right, so consider that Edward's annual revenue was something around 40,000 pounds yearly um, so this is really like a, a massive investment to say the least it is true that well uh, Edward had other enterprises to fund he, he, he fought uh, a bit for a lifetime let's say um, but um, the the English concentration now on a, on a British Empire fundamentally on a uh, on a, an, an English subjugation of at least Britain's um, peoples uh, was the main objective. So it was an investment that didn't sim- that wouldn't simply give like a, a short term benefit that most rulers, of course, need because um, it, it is to some degree the most. You, you may never know what happens next. So if you can gain. You gain now, but but this land was of course understood to be just next door to England. It was already partially anglicized, and at least when things started to seemingly reverse, um, it was knocked out, right? And all these resources were were invested. It's really really a lot. In any case, it, it was evidently worth it, 
right? It was uh, a great accomplishment achieved in a fundamentally on the short medium term and under Edward's reign, like you have the matter settled practically. So um, the uh, the rest again, there would be chances of Wales to to rebel once again, but. Uh, in a completely different situation from before that as we've seen had also been relatively threatening but maybe not for the unity of England as such but you know if say the English had had difficulties in bringing the Welsh down uh, more than the ones they had late they they, they I, we don't know what would the rest of history like with France Scotland etc would have gone uh, in any case the success here is indicative of a contained power that the English could afford to to deal with in such fashion. Uh, plus, Wales provided with resources later on, right? Uh, even if the Esker had to bear the cost of the ongoing garrisoning of Wales, uh, the maintenance of the fortresses, etc., um, there was um, an important contribution right uh, uh, to 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 the to the king of england uh, coffers politically speaking the uh, the conquest of wales and the, the the financial effort for the enterprise had extended the role of membership of the english parliament right because taxes were needed at that point to be raised um, and so there was something exchanged that the king uh, gave there to be financed. But in any case, these are, again, just considerations for a very short introduction. And there are some chapters in medieval history here that we are just barely touching on uh, sometimes, but they are really um, significant and uh, would just pave the way for much more in-depth content compared to this one. Um, for today, thus, I, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.